Today's ancient witness comes from Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 through 29. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came so that we might be reckoned as righteous by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed, your, clothed yourself with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. And so we pray that through these ancient words of our past and uh, we in our words here today, our singing, our time here together, we pray that through all of this, we may experience the presence of God. So when I was thinking about what to talk about today, I knew there was going to be some, there were going to be some people here who maybe are wondering what kind of a church this is, you know, and. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about that. I want to talk about how what we've seen uh, in, in our culture here, um, we're all too aware that Christianity is in trouble. Every, every study I've seen shows that, 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 uh, that the church, uh, you know, church population is decreasing. Uh, people are leaving in droves. Um, the younger Generations are finding Christian, Christianity to be irrelevant. And so if you look at the demographic information, it doesn't look good. They're all rejecting Christianity in favor of no religion at all. That, whole, that category of none of the above, that's the, growing, that's the fastest growing category of all those categories. And so a lot of us are asking why. Why is this the case? And I think that one of the major reasons for this exodus uh, from Christianity is the church itself. And I think we have to be honest about this. I think it's important to look at what the church has become in order to understand this trend. It's undeniable. More and more people are leaving Christianity because they're seeing a kind of Christianity that is anti-science, it's anti-gay, it's anti-immigrant, anti-choice. You know, the list goes on and on, and many of them are saying, I'm hearing them talk to me about this. If that's what it means to be a Christian, then you can count me out. Because many of the folks out there, when they think of the word and they hear the word Christian, that's what they think about. There was a former Episcopal bishop, his name is uh, John Shelby Spong, and he said, he once said, unless biblical literalism is challenged overtly in the Christian church itself, it will, in my opinion, kill the Christian faith. It is not just a benign nuisance that afflicts Christianity at its edges, it is a mentality that renders the Christian faith unbelievable to an increasing number of citizens in our world. And I think what we're seeing is we're seeing a lot of folks are saying, I can't believe that. I can't believe that. You know, like, I don't know if you've seen these bumper stickers, you know, you have the Jesus fish on the bumper, and then you have other bumpers have, have the Darwin fish, you know, which I really like, you know, with feet on it. And then, uh, and then you, see, you even see the, the, the bumper sticker of the Jesus fish eating the Darwin fish. Like, not very nice, you know. Um, 
And, and so people are seeing this as like, no, this is not what I want to be a part of. And, and it's not just a, any literalism. It's what I would call a selective literalism. Jesus' words about forgiving debts and selling possessions in order to give more to the poor and welcoming the children. All those words that Jesus said, a lot of people say, oh, those are just figurative. And they're viewed as metaphor. But these passages in the Bible that are about the apocalypse, about the end times, and about this warrior Jesus coming down to conquer all of our enemies, now those are viewed as literal. You see, so it's a selective, a selective kind of literalism. One of my favorite New Testament scholars, Dominic Crossan, said this, it's not that those ancient people told literal stories and we are now smart enough to take them symbolically, but that they told them symbolically and we are now dumb enough to take them literally. And so more and more, you know, being Christian in America is being identif identified with this. And it's also being linked to a kind of nationalism, a false patriotism. More and more it's identified with a, a political party. More and more we're seeing a kind of Christianity that is, is tribal, defining itself as this in-group, while all others on the outside are viewed with suspicion or condescension or even hatred. Other nations, other religions, and those who are not religious at all are all viewed as those outsiders. No wonder people are not attracted to this kind of Christianity anymore. So much of Christianity is identified with, with white privilege in maintaining power at any costs as America is becoming more and more diverse. Of course, it wasn't long ago that much of American Christianity justified the enslavement of Africans brought to this land against their will. And so it isn't surprising that this supremacist philosophy would still inhabit our churches, perhaps in a slightly different form. In America, we often typically see this exclusive Christianity known for who they want to keep out or control or what ideas and voices they want to silence, you see. And this has gained, gained ascendancy. So when people talk about Christianity, this is what they think of. And so what they do, they reject everything. And I, you know, frankly, I understand that. I, I understand that. Which really, I think, lays a burden upon us who don't want to be associated with that. To, to paraphrase this, an old joke, after a person died, they found themselves at the proverbial pearly gates, and they were lovingly welcomed, and they were given a tour, and there were all kinds of people there. There were Buddhists and Hindus and indigenous and non-religious people too, and they were from every nation and every culture. They were gay, straight, binary, and non-binary. They were rich and poor. This wonderful, this beautiful array of humanity, and not just humans, but animals and other, other living things as well. And then they came to one part, and the guide says, shh, we need to be really quiet now, because these are the American Christians, and they think that they're the only ones here. Now, there's another, there was a, a, a comedian, his name was Emo Phillips, and he tells one of my favorite uh, uh, religious stories I've ever heard. He said, once I saw this guy on a bridge, and he was about to jump, and I said, don't do it. And he said, nobody loves me. And I said, God loves you. Do you believe in God? And he said, yes, I, 
I, I said, are you a Christian or a Jew? And he said, a Christian. I said, me too. Protestant or Catholic? He said, Protestant. And I said, me too. What denomination? And he said, Baptist. I said, you know, me too. Oh my goodness, me too. Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? He said, Northern Baptist. I said, oh, I can't believe it. Me too. Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist? <laughs> He said, Northern Conservative Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region or Northern Conservative Baptist Eastern Region? He said, Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region. I said, yeah, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1879 or Northern Conservative Baptist Region Council of 1912? And he said, Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. And I said, die heretic and I pushed him off the <laughs> you know it can get so ridiculous the circle keeps getting smaller and smaller keeping more and more people out but how does this happen I think that this has happened in Christianity through the centuries because Jesus, what he did and what he said, has been excluded. He's ignored. Instead, we find something that you can call, that I often call, creedal Christianity. That you probably all know about the creeds. If you don't, don't worry about it. They were developed in the 4th and 5th centuries by leaders in the church who found themselves merged with the empire, a different kind of nationalism. And Constantine was the emperor of Rome, and so he decided that Christianity would help him unify his kingdom, and so he made it the preferred religion of the land. And so he put certain religious leaders into power, of, and he called these councils together to to articulate and to define the faith. And so you see Christianity at that particular time merging with money and power and status. This is in the fourth and fifth century. But the alliance came with a cost. The Jesus movement became disconnected from its roots. And Brian McLaren said that before Christianity was a rich and powerful religion, before it was associated with, with buildings and budgets and crusades and colonialism and televangelism, it began, he said, as a revolutionary nonviolent non movement promoting a new kind of aliveness at the margins of society. And so I think what happened was that Christianity lost track of its founder and his message. And through the years, this happened over and over again. And the thing about creedal Christianity is that Jesus is missing. You know, one of the creeds, the Apostle Creed says, I believe in God, the Almighty. And, and then it says, and I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary. And then it says, and then he suffered under Pontius Pilate and was crucified, dead, and buried. But wait a minute. This, this what's supposed to be the summary of our faith, goes from the conception and the birth to the suffering and the death and skips everything that happens in between. And I kind of think that that's important. That Jesus is missing. His life, his teachings, his message, his deeds, everything. And so that's how you can get these other forms of Christianity which don't make any sense at all. It is this kind of Christianity, the only, 
The only thing that's important about Jesus in creedal Christianity is that he was a victim and that he died. That he's, this, he's a mere sacrifice for a kind of God who demands a sacrifice. A kind of God who wants this, a bloodthirsty God who needs to be appeased in order to love. And here's the thing. When Jesus is just a sacrifice, you can have a Christianity that's used as a tool of the empire that views women as subordinate to men, that is heterosexist, that justifies conquest and justifies colonialism, that is a slaveholder's religion. It's a Christianity that removes all the content of the teachings of Jesus. That's how you can have that. And when you remove Jesus himself, you can have this kind of imperial Christianity for for the empire, either the Roman Empire or the American Empire. And then you can use it. You can use it for your own purposes. You can use it to dominate and to conquer and to impose your will on other people. When Jesus and his teachings are removed, the faith then loses its way. It becomes a counterfeit religion, an empty shell. And so no wonder, no wonder the people don't want any part of it. As Henry Nouwen said, for Jesus, there are no countries to be conquered, no ideologies to be imposed, no people to be dominated. There are only children, women, and men to be loved. In Jesus and his teachings, we find this linkage between God and violence is now broken. And we experience a God who loves all people without condition. In Jesus, we see a vision in compassion that is inclusive that crosses borders and cultures. We see that the walls of hostility and division are demolished. And as Paul said, there is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. And today we can add this list today. We can say there's no longer straight or gay. There is no longer binary or non-binary. For you know what? You are all one in Christ. According to the message and the teachings of Jesus, we are all one. And we simply need to act that way. Right? And yet the followers of Jesus have often turned the words of Jesus upside down. Instead of proclaiming with Jesus the message of God's inclusive love, the church has often proclaimed exclusion. The story has always been that God is always more inclusive and more loving than God's children think. Carl Sandburg was once asked, you know, what is the ugliest word in the English language? And after he thought for a while, he said, exclusive. So, you know, we have our work cut out for us. We have our work cut out for us to let the world know that there's there's an alternative kind of Christianity out there. An inclusive Christianity. What is an inclusive Christianity? Well, inclusive Christianity is not merely a community that strives to include all people, that's physically impossible, but an inclusive Christianity always points beyond itself And we say, you know, we are not the whole thing. We are part of the thing. We are part of the whole. And so we strive to demonstrate in our own limited way God's great hospitality. Inclusive Christianity is the opposite of what we can call imperial Christianity, which seeks to impose one view 
on everybody. It seeks to conquer or convert. It is the Christianity of the Crusades. This mindset seeks to clean the church and to drive out all the impurities. And, you know, they're talking about us, by the way. All the liberals, all the progressives, all those with different views. It seeks to force its own particular understanding of creation, of birth control and sexuality, of marriage, and of when human life begins. It seeks to impose all this on everybody in the whole nation. Inclusive Christianity, on the other hand, doesn't fear encounters with other traditions, other faiths, but embraces them. It seeks other traditions not, it sees other traditions not as competition, but as being complementary. And so what I'm talking about is this alternative Christianity to the kind of Christianity that is so prevalent in our nation today and is being rejected by so many people. I'm talking about Christianity that is maybe the best kept secret that so many people don't even know exists. I'm talking about a Christianity that takes the Bible seriously, but not literally. That believes in scientific facts and empirical truths. That would have the Jesus fish and the Darwin fish kiss each other. I'm talking about a Christianity that focuses on the life and the teachings of Jesus. I'm talking about a Christianity that works for the kingdom of fairness and justice on earth and not just in heaven. It's a kind of Christianity in which we are called to use our heads and not just our hearts. It's not a Christianity with all easy answers but one that embraces mystery and ambiguity. There is a diversity of thought and different ways of being. And like the parables of Jesus, it sometimes leaves us with more questions than conclusions. And so, friends, may this be a community that continues to strive to point beyond itself, demonstrating God's inclusive and universal love for all. Amen.